Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am Joe Hollywood. And I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello, hello. And Andrew Walker. And the theme. I'm sorry, Joe, I got to stop you right there. You didn't ask me if I finally came up with a nickname. <laughs> and I actually did this time. Oh, all right. All right. Let's hear your... Uh... Small miracle. And, and because of the season? <laughs> yes. I'm, I, I thought really long and hard about this today at work during my lunchtime. And boo. And boo. All right. Yay! We'll go with it. Get it? Boo? Like, oh, I'm going oh, to right. boo. I'm going to boo something. Oh. <laughs> All right. That's we why are you never joined think of by over lunch. And boo, <laughs> Walking Dead. How is that? Oh, yeah, well yeah. done. A second. It's second place. Okay. <laughs> so today's theme <clears throat> of Hollywood crime scene. Uh, today's our Halloween episode. Halloween yes. is right around the corner. So today's theme. Is haunted Hollywood, <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. and I gotta say I had a lot of fun uh, researching this one and getting prepared for tonight's podcast. Uh, obviously, Hollywood uh, is notoriously haunted. Uh, lots of locations around Hollywood have been uh, reported to have ghosts and spirits and things like that. Uh, first and foremost, that comes to mind uh, is sort of a carryover from last time's. Uh, episode last our last podcast the hollywood sign uh on our last podcast we talked about blonde bombshells and one of those blonde bombshells was peg entwistle and as we covered last time she jumped from the h in the hollywood land sign in 1932 and since then people have reported seeing the figure of a woman in 1930s garb uh walking uh, along the hollywood sign uh they smell her perfume. I think they said it was gardenias or something like that. Uh, so that's uh, one of the the key haunted locations in Hollywood is the Hollywood sign. And, uh, gosh, I would love to get up there at night one day and, and just look for that, you know? Like, what's that? What's that over there? I would love to experience, uh, you know, the hair standing up on the, uh, your arms and, and uh, experience a ghost haunting the Hollywood sign. Uh, one of my favorite uh, haunts... And uh, on Hollywood Boulevard is the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Are you guys familiar with the Hollywood Roosevelt? I have heard of it. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm the, not particularly. It is. Uh, it has been on Hollywood Boulevard and uh, the hub of Hollywood for a long, long time, and it is reportedly haunted by several figures, not the least of which is Marilyn Monroe. Uh, Montgomery Clift, who was in um, uh, From Here to Eternity. Now, uh, one year uh, when I was in L.A., I went to go explore the, the, the Roosevelt. I had a buddy with me, and we were looking around, and we had ha- heard the story of a full-length mirror that had once occupied Marilyn Monroe's uh, suite that overlooked the pool, I believe. Hmm. And... The story goes that after she passed away, uh, there's one story in particular where a cleaning person was, I think, cleaning the mirror and saw what she described as a sad-looking blonde woman behind her. And when she turned to her to ask what she needed, there was nobody there. And people have since reported seeing the reflection of Marilyn Monroe in this mirror. So when I went to explore the Hollywood Roosevelt. This was back in 2005, I believe. My buddy and I were kind of looking around and we're like, where's where's that mirror today? I wonder where that mirror is. And the, the place is so cool. There's so much history there. There's uh, the, the ballroom, when you come going through the entrance off of Hollywood Boulevard, the ballroom to your right is where they held the very first Academy Award ceremony. There's a set of tiled steps where Shirley Temple reportedly practiced uh, dance moves with Mr. Bojangles for a film, oh. and people staying at the hotel, you know, watch these actors practice on the steps. So much history there. Marilyn Monroe uh, did her first 
paid modeling gig on the on the diving board of the swimming pool for suntan lotion. Oh wow. So of course she's going to haunt the hotel and she was a regular there of course. So as my friend and I were exploring the hotel looking for this mirror trying to figure out where it is, I finally asked the the bartender, the little bar in the lobby there. I said, "Where's this mirror I've heard so much about?" And he said, "Turn around." And I turned around, and there it was right behind me, the haunted Marilyn Monroe mirror. It gave me chills. Wow. And so I got to see it. Uh, apparently, they have since gotten rid of it. I guess people were coming in specifically looking for this mirror, and uh, apparently they got rid of it. I don't know where it is today. I don't know if it's in storage or if someone bought it or they donated it. I don't know. But uh, sadly, if you go to the Roosevelt today, uh, you can't see the haunted mirror. See, what um, made that weird is the bartender tells you to turn around. You turn around, and you turn back, the bartender's gone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that would be awesome. Now, one of the other spirits that reportedly haunts the hotel is an actor named Montgomery Clift. Uh, like I said, he was in From Here to Eternity, and he was good friends with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. And he was involved in a pretty serious, I think it was a one-car accident, uh, that pretty much almost ended his career. He he basically face planted into the steering wheel in this accident, and he was a very good looking guy, and he was scarred and and um and basically ended his career. And he led a life of alcoholism and and stuff after that. He never kind of mentally recovered from the accident. But uh, while filming from here to eternity, he stayed at the Hollywood Roosevelt, and. I guess uh, his character in the film had to know how to play the bugle. And so at the time that he was at the hotel, he would practice his bugling. And so people today claim that they can hear the faint sound of a bugle down the hallway and and people being approached and touched in cold spaces uh, in the room where he stayed and stuff like that. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of cool stories about uh, the hauntings at... Um, the uh, at the hotel, the Hollywood uh, Roosevelt. Um, another person who was spotted, uh, the ghostly figure of a person spotted on the 12th floor, where Carol Lombard and Clark Gable used to have rendezvous. Uh, the ghost of Carol Lombard, Lombard has been spotted at the hotel. Now, for those of you who don't know who Carol Lombard is, very beautiful blonde actress. We could have talked about her during our uh, Blonde Bombshell episode. Um, but she she was a very popular, well-liked actress uh, from the World War II era. And she went on a, a war bond tour and okay. raised $2 million on her war bond tour. Now, she, most of the time that she was traveling on the war bond tour, she was traveling by train. But as it wrapped up, she was kind of tired and said, I, I want to get home quickly. Let's book a plane. And people warned her about it, said, I don't think I would do a plane. And she said, no, I just want to get home. So she boarded a plane with her mother, uh, an MGM publicity agent and uh, 15 young army pilots uh, almost immediately after taking off for some reason the pl the plane veered off course and slammed right into a mountain uh, her body was retrieved along with her mother and buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale when Gable died in 1960 who was just just destroyed when Carol Lombard who he had been married to uh, when she died, he never recovered from that. He died just a few years later in 1960. Uh, he was interred next to Lombard uh, at the, the Forest Lawn Cemetery. Now, the Forest Lawn Cemetery is one of those cemeteries in L.A. that's a who's who, uh, anyone who is anyone is buried at uh, Forest Lawn. And I've visited it once or twice, and it's pretty wild walking around there and spotting tombstones and grave sites of it's some of the most famous people. It's one of the few people. cemeteries that actually has a tour based around it, probably. You could probably I, I don't see a lot of those cemeteries don't really encourage that sort of thing. Right. Like if you keep to yourself and, and you wander in there and you look around, you should be okay. But if you walked in there with a dozen people going, here's the grave site, of, they probably would ask you to oh, leave. Okay. I'm ho okay, so there's some <laughs> level of decency there. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think the, the cemetery encourages that right. sort of thing thing there are tour guides like uh dearly departed graveyard tours 
and they do that sort of thing. But uh, I don't think the cemeteries really encourage that. But if you are to visit uh, Forest Lawn, here's some of the notable burials at Forest Lawn. Walt Disney, whose uh, gravesite is kind of hidden. Like, it's not out in the open with a giant monument. It's kind of hidden, and you have to know where to look. And it's kind of in an alcove, and you go over there, and you go, oh, this is Disney's. Wow. Uh, so he's there. Um, Michael Jackson uh, is at that uh, at that cemetery. Uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Now, I have an interesting story about Elizabeth Taylor. So when I was in L.A. in 2011, uh, Elizabeth Taylor passed away while I was in L.A. Now, a buddy of mine and I were visiting another uh, cemetery, which I'm going to mention in a little while, and we saw that there was a wall crypt uh, that was part of the uh, Elizabeth Taylor's family plot, and some of her other family members were already in this wall crypt, and apparently Elizabeth Taylor was supposed to be buried there. And I remember saying to my my buddy, gosh, can you imagine this is where they're going to put Elizabeth Taylor? And because of her Jewish faith, uh, they usually bury you very, very quickly after you die. And so it'd be, wow, that'd be, that'd be something to see. Well, a day or two later, my buddy and I are at uh, Forest Lawn, and we wanted to visit the wall crypt of Larry Fine from the Three Stooges. Oh. So we cool. find his name on the wall. It's just simple. It says Larry Fine. My buddy pulls out his phone. He plays the Three Stooges theme. We stand there speaking, you know, our fond memories of Larry Fine and Larry Fine and paying our, paying our tributes to him. And as we walk out of the, the mausoleum there uh, that uh, where he's in the wall, there's anarchy. We, we walk out and we're like, what is going on? Helicopters, press, media. My buddy and I had accidentally stumbled onto Elizabeth Taylor's funeral, <laughs> which apparently oh. was moved from the original cemetery that we were supposed that we were at, where she was supposed to be interred. We accidentally stumbled on it at at this cemetery and was right smack dab in the middle of all the the craziness. <laughs> and I'm like, what do we do? <laughs> and we Blend said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and well, do do we stay and like attend the funeral? And we thought that would really be pushing our luck. So we said, "All right, let's." We had something else planned. We said, "Let's let's go on to our next thing." And as we pulled out, vans, cameras. Who are these guys? What? Who? Who are they? Like they thought we were part <laughs> of this. It was it was pretty crazy that we accidentally stumbled onto Elizabeth Taylor's funeral. But I would have said to them as. You guys, I, I don't have a statement right now. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I just, overcome with grief. Uh, yeah, I'm overcome with grief. Um, I, when, when the time is right, I will reach out to the press. Um, if any of you like my contact information, <laughs> leave it at that. Give them y- right. your phone number and email and then concoct the most <laughs> absurd story that you could come up with. That's, yeah. what, that's, that's what I would do. So, you know, <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that always happens to me when I'm in L.A. I always find myself right smack dab in the middle of stuff. It's pretty funny. Yes. Uh, so that was a great story. Um, so she's in the uh, Great Mausoleum. Uh, apparently she requested to be near Michael Jackson. So they're actually near each other in the Great Mausoleum at Forest Lawn. Uh, Nat King Cole is there. Uh, Errol Flynn, who surprisingly for the longest time had an unmarked grave. Like, uh, tourists weren't able to find his grave. It was unmarked. Apparently, some people got together and paid for a headstone uh, at uh, his grave. So, Errol Flynn? Errol Flynn. The swash, swashbuckling Errol Flynn, for the longest grave. time, had an unmarked grave. Isn't that shocking? Did, was it intentional? Like, did he put anything in his will? Like, hey, I, you know, I want... That's a good question. I want that I, to I be low-key after I pass away. Or if... I, I don't know much about him, but... Did he not have money, like, at the end, or? I know, he, you know, he, he suffered from alcoholism and stuff. I don't know if he had any offspring, so maybe it was just oh. one of those deals where when he passed, no one really took up to, to protect his studios, legacy. studios, that's cold blood. Yeah, you, yeah. you would never see that happen in 2022. Yeah, exactly. Never. <laughs> so when I visited, I think it was in 2005, I found his gravesite, paid my respects to Errol Flynn. Uh, Spencer Tracy, Sam Cook, who we talked about uh, on our podcast before. He's at the cemetery. Right. L. Frank Baum, the creator of the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Sammy Davis Jr. Gene Harlow uh, is at this uh, 
at the cemetery. We talked. Yeah, I was going to say she sound, sounds sounds kind of familiar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was buried <laughs> in her gown from Libeled Lady, I believe it is, um, and wow. she's in the first wing of the Sanctuary of the Benediction. Uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen, and the It Girl Clara Bow, who was uh, a star of the silent film era. So. This uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale, California, is just a star-studded affair. How big is this place? Is it's it... pretty massive. It's okay. it's pretty big. You can you can walk around for a while, and there's outdoor grave sites, and then the mausoleums with the wall crypts and everything. So you can spend a good part of your afternoon ex- exploring if that's what you're into. So yeah, and that's something I I have to admit I do enjoy doing when I'm in L.A. I like going to the cemeteries and seeing all the legends of Hollywood and where they are for eternity. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, another haunted uh, attraction in Hollywood is the Culver Studios. Uh, reportedly, the f- uh, film producer Thomas Ince, who uh, f- he founded his first movie studio in Hollywood in 1918, uh, he has been seen wandering the main administration building uh, heading over to the executive screening room, which when he was running the studio uh, was his own private screening room. Uh, so today the studio is known as the Culver Studios. It's not open to public tours, but uh, the main building is pretty cool. I think it was built to resemble George Washington's home. What What is the name of George Washington's home? I forget Mount, what it was. Vernon, Mount, Mount Vernon. Yeah, Mount Vernon's I, I think it was designed to look like... Yeah. Uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon home. They said his um, ghost is still walking there. They say today uh, <laughs> Ince is still roaming the halls of the Culver Studios. And that's why you can't let the Hollywood critics get to you. One <laughs> bad review, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Now, there's an interesting story uh, behind Hearst, or I'm sorry, behind Ince that involves uh, Hearst, the newspaper publisher. Right. And so. When when uh, Ince died, the official cause of death was heart failure. Uh, he died in 1924 at the age of 44. But the L.A. Times ran immediately after his passing. Movie producer shot on Hearst Yacht. And everyone was like, wait, what? Uh, we, we were told he had heart failure. Yeah, that's a pretty big jump on cause of death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, if you shoot someone in the heart, I guess you could call it heart failure. But um, yeah, if you ignore the lead poisoning, sure. <laughs> I love that phrase, lead poisoning. Um, now, here's the thing: rumors uh, claim that uh, William Randolph Hearst shot Ince when he was on a yacht with Charlie Chaplin, Marion Davies, who Hearst had an affair with, who also, I believe, was in an affair with. Charlie Chaplin and Thomas Ince was were all on Hearst yacht, and I and the rumor goes that a jealous Hearst, thinking he was going to shoot Chaplin, shot Ince in the head instead. And there are several people who corroborate that, which is makes this all very weird and seedy. So Chaplin's valet claimed to have seen Ince coming off the yacht in a stretcher in San Diego. And he told his wife, I saw him come off the yacht and his head was bleeding from a bullet wound. Uh, A woman named Eleanor Glenn, who was also on the yacht, said that everyone aboard the yacht was sworn to secrecy. Some people received payments, um, had a hopper who worked for Hearst uh, on his newspapers reportedly was given a huge promotion to kind of sweep it under the rug. So there's lots of weird circumstantial evidence that Ince may have been murdered by William Randolph Hearst, who had the resources to keep it all oh, yeah. under the rug. Uh, so his body was cremated at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And then uh, return to his family. So, I mean, Hollywood is full of gossip mongers. You'd have to imagine <laughs> that. Wait a minute, Charlie and Hearst are going on this thing, and they're both after her. Yeah, maybe I should sit this <laughs> boat trip out because that's that's just a recipe for disaster. We're gonna go on your yacht out in the middle of the water. No one knows. Yeah, sign me up. 
Like so. Natalie Wood. Exactly. Uh, it's very, very <laughs> similar. Yes. And apparently there have been a couple of movies that have been produced since that have storylines that are very, very similar to this whole Hearst Chaplin and Marion Davies love triangle thing. So hmm. uh, so rumors were floating around Hollywood. Some people turned it into uh, work of fiction, but they say that the circumstances of some of these movies are very similar to what happened well, Joe, on like that you yacht. Said, you know, stuff, it sounded salacious, it still is, but applied now. Jeffrey Epstein died of a broken neck. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, he hung himself. So. <laughs> they Corners. say the yeah. simplest answer is usually yeah. the right one. Yeah, I guess. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which I just mentioned. Uh, again, one of my favorite places to visit. It it is it shares an adjoining wall to Paramount Studios, which is also reportedly haunted. We'll talk about. In a I mean, bit. come on. <laughs> you, can you imagine getting that office? You everyone else has a view of the valley. You, You're looking outside of the cemetery. You have a view of the cemetery. Jeez. Now there are lots of notable burials there, but the first one I want to talk about is Rudolph Valentino. Uh, he died oh. tragically at the age of 31 in 1926 of a burst appendix. Uh, upon hearing the news of Valentino's death, who gain worldwide fame in The Sheik, the silent film, The Sheik. Uh, women reportedly committed suicide after learning that Valentino had died. Uh, he reportedly haunts his former home, known as Falcon's Lair. I love that. On Bella Drive in Beverly Hills. The man had flair. <laughs> <laughs> his ghost has been spotted in his bedroom, of course, and in the stable among the horses. He also reportedly haunts his former beach house in Oxnard, where he stayed while making the Sheik. And he haunts room 210 at the Santa Maria Inn. Uh, Rudy is interred at the Hollywood Cemetery and supposedly haunts the cemetery, among other uh, notable names as Clifton Webb and Virginia Rapp, who, if, if that name sounds familiar to you, she was the supposed victim of the Fatty Arbuckle assault okay. that some people claim took her life, even though Fatty Arbuckle was uh, found innocent. Uh, and coincidentally, haunting Hollywood Forever Cemetery is William Randolph Hearst. Uh, okay. I so mean, I'm sure had a tormented life. Yeah. He's the one who uh, reportedly Citizen Kane yes, was based yep. on, and he was not happy about it and tried to sabotage the oh, film. Yeah. He wanted to buy the film and burn every remaining copy yeah, of it. Yeah, so. there was definitely some and, some some somebody crossed somebody with right and i was with about, that and i was about to say valentino and orson welles busier in death than in life the man's <laughs> at four places oh my god yeah he still gets around Jeez. you know <laughs> now the interesting thing i visited valentino's uh grave site again he's in a wall uh crypt and it is it is spectacular it's okay. beautiful and the uh, story goes that immediately after his death uh, and you may have heard the story the mysterious lady in black uh, visits his uh, his gravesite every year delivering flowers, and she did so for 28 years before they stopped. Now, people say they have seen the lady in black since then, but more than likely these were publicity stunts or yeah. actresses just trying to draw attention to themselves. But nobody knew who this lady in black was who continued to deliver flowers to Valentino's grave every year for 28 years. Which cool. is kind of the paparazzi dropping the ball here. <laughs> yeah. 28 years. On, on, from the years 20 to 8, someone say, who's that lady? Can you follow her? <laughs> That's right. Can we get an interview? Just follow her. <laughs> Jeez. Now, uh, like I said, Hollywood Forever is, again, one of my favorite places to visit, being right next door to Paramount Studios. Other notable burials at Hollywood Forever. Douglas Fairbanks, senior and junior, who have this amazing like mausoleum and marble bench and huge reflecting pool. It's really something to behold. It's pretty cool. Um, Mel Blanc is uh, buried oh. at Hollywood Forever. And believe it or not, his uh, epitaph on his tombstone reads, ebity, ebity, ebity. that's all, folks. Oh, I, was, wow. I was wondering which, which character it would be. Yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> that's on his tombstone. I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, Anton Yelchin. 
You guys know Anton Yelchin? Yes, yeah. Chekhov. Uh, he yeah, is, yeah. Yep, he uh, is buried there. He was uh, tragically crushed by his own vehicle on his property when it was rolling downhill and he tried to stop it. Yeah. And he was 27. Yeah. Uh, you can find his gravesite at the cemetery because it has a life size statue of Anton on the gravesite. Wow. I, did, I did not know that. I didn't either. Wow. Another dude in the 27. Club, right yeah yeah uh cecil b demille legendary director is at the cemetery uh a really cool uh grave site that i visited uh, is johnny ramon he has kind of a bust of himself on his grave site playing guitar it is spectacular um dd ramon is also there uh another former topic of our podcast bugsy siegel is interred in a wall uh crypt at uh the cemetery Jane Mansfield, who we talked about recently, yeah. Tyrone Power, Toto, the dog oh. from Wizard of Oz. I was thinking the 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 eighties band, <laughs> the <laughs> entire band, the entire band. They had a they, they had might a be pack. there too. I don't know. If one guy died, they were all going to be buried together, you whether know, they wanted to. There's a to part or of me that always thought that there would <clears throat> be a separate cemetery for celebrity animals like Mr. Ed. Oh yeah, Flipper, right. I'm, I'm Toto. I'm surprised there isn't already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, uh, remember Grumpy Cat? Grumpy, Grumpy Cat passed away. Oh, oh yeah. So, you know, he, yeah. he should be there. Is that there the meme? Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. a real cat. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Famous. Now, one of my <laughs> one of my personal favorite experiences uh, while I was exploring Hollywood Forever was stumbling onto the uh, grave site of Carl Schweitzer. Anyone know who Carl Schweitzer is? No. You may know him as Alfalfa. From the Little Resk. Oh, no. Now, <laughs> yeah, he's buried there. Now, he, in, in the later part of his life, even though he, he died young, which we're going to talk about in a second, he uh, had something to do with uh, hunting dogs. He provided hunting dogs to celebrities and, and was like a hunting expert and a guide and would go out with Jimmy Stewart and celebrities like that on hunting excursions. So there's a dog on his tombstone, which supposedly represents his experience with hunting dogs. But when I saw it, the first thing I thought of was Petey. Remember Petey the dog with the big circle around his yeah, eye? Yeah. So I thought that was Petey on his tombstone. <laughs> uh, but his, his tragic ending was he was killed in 1959 after visiting the apartment of a guy that owed him $50. And he demanded his $50. And the guy was like, I don't have it. And apparently uh, alf little alfalfa pulled a knife on him or something, and the guy, sh the guy shot him. That's a little rascal's episode. How do you bring a he, knife how, to a gunfight? Yeah. How, <laughs> how old was he? He was uh, 20, what was it? 27? 27. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was it? Yeah, 20. Oh, no, wait, 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 no, wait, wait, wait. come wait. on. Don't feed into this, Joe. He was killed Joe. in 1959. I don't, I don't have his age down, but he died young. He died fairly young. We'll just say 27. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're not, <laughs> we're, we're not going to. You guys got your yes. phones. Look up. We look are going to old to it, Alpha was when he no, died. Yeah, Would it blow your mind if he was 27 when yeah, he died? I, we're, we're, hey, we're, if we're, I'm right, Nick, you won't you cash at me $10. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, a judge ruled the death justifiable homicide. The, ga the guy that shot him claimed that he felt his life was threatened. I, apparently, Carl Schweitzer had been drinking. Um, but imagine being the guy who killed Alfalfa. Man, okay. you had 31. Thirty one. Uh, right. Still fairly young. Um now here's a weird coincidence. I mentioned two burials at uh the Hollywoods uh, forever, uh, Carl Schweitzer and Cecil B. DeMille. Well he died on the exact same day as Cecil B. DeMille. Carl Schweitzer and Cecil B. DeMille died on the exact same day, same year. Um and here's the weird thing that ties it all together. There's a rumor going around that Carl Schweitzer had an uncredited role in the Ten Commandments as a slave. <laughs> so he was directed by uh, Cecil B. DeMille or Cecil wow. B. DeMille. So that's a weird uh, – they died on the same day or buried at the same cemetery and had worked together. That, that kind of blows my mind I, a little I bit. would be surprised if half of L.A. County wasn't uh, – <laughs> An extra on the Ten Commandments. I mean, <laughs> right. that's, yeah, that's got to be one of the people. biggest. So Hollywood is the city Extras. of dreams and the city of weird coincidences. Exactly. <laughs>
And I here's a little personal weird coincidence. I, I did some research in the house that I grew up in Hamtramck, where I grew up. Uh, I heard rumors that there was a, a, a Hollywood star that lived either in my house or next to my house. And as I looked up census records and everything, I found out that uh, she lived in the house next to mine long before I ever lived there. Her name was Gail Kobe, and she graduated in Hamtramck, uh, went out to, I, I want to say, UCLA or one of those California colleges out there, wanted to be an actress, had a bit part uh, on, I think it was the Paramount lot, and was spotted by Cecil B. DeMille and cast in The Ten Commandments. And that began her career. Uh, she got disenchanted with the whole acting thing. She saw the way that uh, women actresses were being treated in Hollywood. So she focused more on the producer side and is credited with sort of uh, honing the genre of the soap opera. Um, and so she was a very powerful producer uh, in L.A. who got her start on the Ten Commandments uh, under the direction of Cecil B. DeMille, and she grew up in the house right next to my house. So a wow. little yeah. personal uh, rabbit hole uh, connection there. So Cool. Uh, now, as I said, uh, the cemetery is right next door to Paramount Studios, so of course Paramount Studios is haunted. How can it not be? <laughs> uh, security guards, especially those working on the night shift, report frequent hauntings. Uh, some claim that one spirit that haunts Paramount Studios is Lucille Ball because Desi Lou was, uh, which used to be RKO, uh, she bought RKO, who was her former employer. They, her and Desi formed Desi Lou, and then Desi Lou was absorbed by Paramount. So Desi Lou Studios was part of the current Paramount Studios uh, property. So of course, Lucille Ball is going to wander around uh, the Paramount Studios lot. Uh, here's an interesting one. This is a very specific one. On Soundstage 19 at Paramount, where Happy Days was filmed, uh, the stage is reportedly haunted by Heather or O'Rourke. Uh, now, if you recognize that name, she was the cute little blonde girl who was in the movie Poltergeist. And not too long after that, she was on I th like the final season of Happy Days where Fonzie was dating a woman who had a young daughter and Heather O'Rourke played uh, the daughter on Happy Days. Well, she died very young. Uh, she died at 12 of a weird illness that may have stemmed from drinking well water at her home in Big Bear Lake. Uh, in 1988, she showed flu-like symptoms, collapsed in her home, rushed to the hospital, uh, went into cardiac arrest, had back-to-back -back cardiac arrest episodes, and died on February 1st at the age of 12. Um, she is uh, buried at Westwood Village Memorial Park, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but she is part of a, a curse, I guess you can say, that's associated with the movie Poltergeist. Yeah. Because not only did Heather die at 12, her co-star, who uh, is Dominique Dunn, I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do you know, there's an actor named Griffin Dunn, yeah. or is it Dune? Is it Dunn? Dunn? All right. So, D-U-N-N-E. Yeah. Yep. So Dominique Dunn, uh, who was also in Poltergeist with Heather, uh, she was in a abusive relationship with a guy who I, I don't want to mention his name. I don't want to put a spotlight on him. Um, but she was in an abusive relationship. It was on again, off again. She finally decided she was going to separate permanently uh, when the boyfriend came to her home, called her out uh, outside of her home. She went out to confront him, and he strangled her to death uh, on the, her own property uh, in the driveway there. Uh, here's the tr thing that just irks me is when it went to trial, and this guy admitted, he, like, when the cops arrived, he was like, I think I killed my girlfriend. Uh, he was convicted of voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to six years and only served about three and a half before he was freed and and let allowed to live a life as a chef. And, like, that. that's the most tragic part of the story. And the public went after the judge, who many people referred to as one of the worst judges in the L.A. area. And when he started receiving all this backlash, he was like, yeah, I thought the sentence was too light. And it's like, well, you presided over the trial. 
And so apparently the murderer is still out there living his life. But last I heard, he was in Florida. <laughs> um, so, Weird. so yeah. So both um, Heather and Dominique were part of this poltergeist curse. Um, now, imagine those Pete. Uh, you're familiar with uh, production curses. Uh, the Poltergeist one is a, a fairly common one. I don't know if I can rattle off any other names of the production that suffered tragic fates, but you're aware of a couple of uh, cursed productions. Why don't you share those? Yeah, because uh, I chose the smart one and said, let me go and check out Hauntings, Hollywood Hauntings on here. And well, the Poltergeist was one. Figures that's the one I didn't look over. I looked over the... Um, Exorcist and the Conjuring franchise. Now, The Exorcist was interesting because on that set, th- there are nine deaths related to that. I mean, mm. you just think about the, the number nine. Wow. You, I you didn't know about, that at all. Yeah, so you talk about... So Max Vincinda, Father Merrick's brother, died on the first day of, of filming. Wow. Cast members... Uh, so uh, if anyone remembers Jason Miller, he's uh, Damien Karras. He's the, fa- he's the other priest in there with Father Merrick. His the actress who plays his mother, she died during production, and uh, there was another character named uh, Burke Denning, played by Jack M- McGowan, and he passed away too before the film re- film was released. So you had family members of cast dying, you had actual cast dying. Wow. Uh, Ellen Burstyn had a notorious back injury because the director insisted on the when she gets flung back by Linda Blair. Yeah. And that scream that you hear is an actual scream oh. of her breaking her back. Yeah, she had. She was wearing like a harness with yep, a cable right. that was supposed to pull her up against the wall, and it it yeah w- went overboard. They they've had so they've had debts on there. They they've had mysterious. Um, so the sets burned down except for the bedroom set with <laughs> Linda Blair. No signs of arson. No signs wow. of uh, of electric fire. What they basically alluded, alluded the fire to was that a that they just said, okay, a bird flew into an electrical box and caused a fire. And <laughs> all the parts of the set, the stage burned down except the bedroom of Linda Blair, which mm. is the, the haunted scene. And uh, they had uh, on-set uh, light workers lost fingers. They lost toes to random accidents. Wow. Uh, they had to, one of the priests who was on the set and, and is, in the, is in the movie as a, as a side character is an actually ordained priest. He came and blessed the set. He couldn't perform an exorcism because he's not that type of priest. Because <laughs> there are two types of exorcism. You mm. can have a minor one and a major one. The major one mm. is what the movie's based off of, and the minor ones are like, hey, uh, we're just you know doing a little happy ceremony here. It's yeah, like, yeah. You know, bless a, this a, house, a, sort of. Yeah, thing. right. A priest can do that. If you want to do a major one, you need a bishop. <laughs> you need someone higher up on the on the hierarchy. And they have to have a specific protocol. Mm. So he had to come and bless the set, and they were going, okay, wow, we're, we're, we're actually going to have to do this. Wow. So, yes, you know, so it's weird that when they, and because The Exorcist is based off of a an, a, an article based off of an actual f- possession that happened in 1949 for a f- priest who went to Mount Rainier and had to save a boy who they thought was going to be deemed possession. Mm. So, when well, you figure when you were pr- a producer and you say, oh, I read this cool article about this creepy horror thing, it's... Do you go and pick at that scab? Do you go and invite <laughs> that problem? And so The Conjuring was another thing. This is an interesting one. So The Conjuring, if everyone's go see that you know, the movies, that I I enjoy a good scare. I, I've never seen any of them. I highly recommend it. Now's the perfect time. It's Halloween. I'm always looking for your quality. Uh, it is horror. It, you know, it, I usually the '80s kind of had that weird thing where it was more about gore than than scariness. But mm. this one in the Conjuring franchise, it's they they it's inspired by the the real life characters Elaine. And Ed, um, oh, Edward and Lorraine uh, Warren, mm-hmm. uh, who Ed to his, you know, say what you want because people can always say I don't believe in this stuff. Fire. He's one of the at the time in the ni- in nineteen seventies. He's one of seven official whoever makes that official because that, <laughs> there's no real paperwork. Demonologist. So demonology is the study of of demons, their hierarchy, and their and the, so he was one of the seven demonologists in, in the country at the time. And people can poke holes, and you know, I'm I'm a skeptic. It's fine. It's okay to be a skeptic, um, and approach it from an analytical point of view. But I'm not uh, arrogant enough to say that there are things I don't understand. Oh. But in the Conjuring franchise, they, the families that were there, they said, "Listen, you know, we felt things." 
uh, Vera, uh, fin, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. It's uh, Farminga, Farminga. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. She was yeah. in uh, the Departed. Yep, and yeah, she's, yeah. And she's uh, up in the air. Yeah. So yeah, she's great. Mm-hmm. She when she took on the role, she said when she finally took on the role and talked to James Wan, the director, she had she looked at her laptop. There were three like s- scratch marks on her screen. <laughs> She said, that's weird. Mm. She goes to bed, wakes up the next morning. There's the exact same three scratch marks on her inner thigh. Mm. Oh. Bruises. Oh. And she she took a picture of it. She doesn't know what, what that was about. The families that are the subject of The Conjuring, the daughters that were there, would say that we had bruises on us. We didn't understand how they got there. The actress, Joey King, she was on the Howard Stern show. And she said, I had bruises. The makeup people thought... Oh, there she's stealing our bruising makeup and playing jokes on us, putting it mm. on you know on her on her back on her chest, you know w- weird places you'd put it because if you want to draw attention, which no one could see, and she was diagnosed with a medical condition called ITP. They call it idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, which means your body loses platelets and so you start bleeding internally because that's what a bruise is. Usually. Yeah, yeah. And it's say idiopathic because anytime you hear, by the way, quick note. If a doctor ever tells you essential or idiopathic, that means they don't know what causes it. <laughs> oh, really? So they add, you know, the unexplained essential or idiopathic hypertension, like you have high blood pressure. They don't know what's causing your high blood pressure. Ah, uh, okay. You know? But they have to cause something because if you just say, "Hey, we don't know what's causing it," you get mad at the doctor. You know, it's sure. funny to say that because the Heather or Rogue story that I told you, I read that when when they did the autopsy and found out that she had some intestinal thing, she apparently had no signs of that prior to when she pretty much dropped dead and her doctor was quoted as saying we don't know why right. it happened he's like it's it's possible she had always had it but she should have showed some signs so it's very much yeah. along the lines of what you're so, saying that he was kind of throwing his hands up going i don't know and it's weird for joey king because she was i think 12 at the time when she was doing that movie so she goes and says i didn't have the condition before i left i never had the condition since hmm. So it was weird. I you know I didn't take you know I wasn't taking any medications at the time. So my thing with this is that there are these are there are always topics. You find a topic. Oh, that's a story. You hear something like I'd love to go explore that. It's something, and uh, it's funny you were mentioning something, Joe. You're like, hey, I heard about the Hollywood sign. I'd, I'd look in your instinct was let me go check it out. Yeah, well, sure. And I'm not trying to say something here, but I'm going to say something. <laughs> it's very funny that the two white guys in the room, <laughs> that, you know what? I see something creepy. I'm going to go check it out because it's interesting. The, I me, want like, to nope. experience that. I want to <laughs> see something unexplained. I crave that. I've had a couple it's of experiences curious. when I was young, and you're like, oh, it could have been anything. But right. I, I want I want to see the ghost of Lucille Ball. Man, that would be the coolest thing that's I, ever happened to me. If you find Lucille, then Lucille Ball's like, I'm right here. And then this guy is that demon that won't leave me alone. <laughs> it's always a critic. Every episode. Yeah. Especially the one we're on the factory line. <laughs> now, um, now, Heather O'Rourke and Dominique Dunn are coincidentally both buried at the same cemetery, Westwood Village Memorial Park. Again, one of my favorite stomping grounds when I go out to L.A. Um, other notable burials at this cemetery, uh, including some fairly recent uh, burials, Farrah Fawcett, who oh, died wow. in 2009, was buried there. Uh, its most famous resident is Marilyn Monroe, whose grave I've visited many, many times. Uh, there was always rumors that Hugh Hefner had uh, purchased a wall crypt next to Marilyn Monroe, and I was always wondered if that was a rumor or not. Well, the last time I went to L.A., guess who popped up right next to Marilyn was Hugh Hefner. He now will spend in eternity next to Marilyn Monroe. Dude, just can't stop. Yeah. Can't stop. Unbelievable with this guy. Eternity. (laughs) Uh, Natalie Wood, another uh, past subject of our podcast, is buried at the cemetery. She passed away in 1981. Betty Page, who actually lived a, a nice long life. She only passed away in 2008. Oh, uh, she is buried at the cemetery. Uh, another fairly recent addition, Rodney Dangerfield, oh. who, like Mel Blanc, has a really cool tombstone that says, there goes the neighborhood. Oh. <laughs> and I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, Jack Lemon and Walter Matthau, who uh, co-starred in Grumpy Old Men together and several other films, they died one year apart. Both are buried at uh, the cemetery you know, within a few steps of each other. Uh, James Coburn, uh, Eddie Albert, and Ava Gabor are both buried at the cemetery. They both starred in Green Acres yeah. together. Uh, director Billy Wilder, who coincidentally directed Marilyn Monroe in Some Like It Hot and Seven Year Itch, he's buried at the cemetery. 
Dean Martin is a short few steps away from Marilyn Monroe. You can visit Dean Martin's wall crypt. Uh, Carol O'Connor, who is better known as Archie Bunker, he passed away in 2001. Merv Griffin, Donna Reed, George C. Scott. One of the coolest grave markers I've ever seen in my life belongs to Don Knotts. All of his characters from Barney Fife oh, wow. uh, to the incredible Mr. Limpet are all engraved in this like bronze uh, headstone, if you can call it that, grave marker. It's spectacular. Wow. Uh, yeah. Remind me, what year did he pass away? 2006. Fairly, again, fairly recently. Because I can never, in my mind, I can never place like a time or place when he passed. Like, right. Just for whatever reason, I, I never remember him passing. Yeah. Hey, is uh, Andy Griffith still with us? Because No, he's gone. He, okay. He yeah, passed Andy. away a while back. He may have passed away before Don Knotts, I think, but I'm not positive. For whatever reason, those two dudes... Yeah. They they just kind of like live eternally. Like, hey, yeah, exactly. they, they, they still might be alive. I don't know. Yeah, Don Knotts, <laughs> uh, up till the end of his life, he would make personal appearances at events and stuff that's, like that. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And anyway. I uh, I recently purchased his autograph, which uh, was on a uh, uh, Andy Griffith police car. Uh, someone uh, offered it to me, and I, I bought it. So I have Don Knotts' signature on a, a Mayberry police car. Uh, so yeah, so that particular, uh, cemetery, which is sort of hidden, you could drive past it and not even know it's there. It's called Westwood Village Memorial Park. Uh, some amazing residents at this particular cemetery. And if, again, you're into that sort of thing, uh, pay a visit. You, you won't be disappointed. Uh, another haunted location in, uh, in Hollywood is the famed Knickerbocker Hotel, uh, it is the site of some, several notable events. Uh, one that immediately comes to mind is William Frawley, who played Fred Mertz on I Love Lucy, was walking out on the sidewalk when he collapsed. Passerbys uh, picked him up, dragged him into the lobby of the Knickerbocker Hotel, laid him on a couch where he died. And uh, so he he died in the lobby of the Knickerbocker Hotel underneath their spectacular chandelier. It's really, really incredible. Um, another famous event that happened there was an actress named uh, Frances Farmer. Uh, she, beautiful, beautiful actress, but was a notorious, uh, and, and that's this is their words, not mine. She was a notorious troublemaker. She punched people and uh, was trouble on the set. They did a movie. Uh, about it, uh, starring Jessica Lange as uh, or Lang uh, as Francis Farmer, um, but she was staying at the hotel when, and this is a complicated story, but uh, authorities came and dragged her out of the hotel, half naked, kicking and screaming because she had gotten a traffic violation for driving with her headlights on in World War II, where they had like a lights out sort of thing. So she had gotten pulled over for having her lights on, was ticketed, didn't pay the fine. And somehow that led to her getting dragged out of the Knickerbocker, kicking and screaming naked uh, in front of witnesses. I'm like, that's that's pretty extreme for a traffic violation. Yeah, but I'd like to point out, if you are going to be half naked, kicking and screaming is the way is the is the norm because I'd be pretty weird out if they're pretty calm being yeah, dragged that's right. like, half naked. You should be putting up more of a protest, ma'am. Yes. Uh, another really odd story that happened there in 1962, there was a very famous like Oscar winning, uh, Hollywood costume, uh, costume maker. Uh, she went by the name of Irene. Um, I think that's how she's credited in some films, just Irene. Uh, but people knew her as Irene Gibbons, which she had a different name too, but, um, she was at the end of her career. I guess she had difficulty finding work. Uh, she checked in under a pseudonym at the at the Knickerbocker, uh, went up to her hotel, wrote some suicide notes, uh, went to the bathroom window, and leapt to her death onto the uh, uh, lower level um, lobby, I think it was. Mm. Um, and so her ghost is reportedly seen uh, on the window ledge, like people would look up and see a figure on a window ledge. Some say she just vanishes. Others say she leaps from the window ledge. Um, so she's a reported haunt at the Knickerbocker. Uh, D.W. Griffith, who was a famous director of the silent era, he spent his final years there in isolation, like residents there didn't even know 
he was living in this apartment building. All he did was read. Um, supposedly, he haunts uh, the hotel. And kind of a neat story. Uh, I wanted, I'd always wanted to get into the lobby of the Knickerbocker. And currently, I think it's like a retirement home or a, a senior a center or something like that. Oh, wow. And the front door is usually locked and you, you need like key to entry or pass card or something. So one day I was standing out in front of the hotel with a couple of friends and I saw some residents going up the steps to the entrance and I said, let's, let's stay close. So we <laughs> kind of followed them in and as the door started to close, I grabbed it, pulled it open. We walked into the lobby again under this magnificent, uh, magnificent chandelier. And as I'm telling my friends these stories that I just told you, I see the security guard looking at me. And so I'm trying to wrap this up. I'm taking some pictures. And I, uh, he heard me say the, uh, tell my friends the story of, of William Frawley. And the security guard pipes up and says, he died right there. So now he's getting in on the conversation with us. And I'm thinking, this is cool. I'm like, what else can he tell us? And he goes, well... I've heard that Marilyn Monroe haunts the ladies' room. <laughs> and, um, and so my friend Sherry was with us. I said, Sherry, you need to use the ladies' room? She's like, matter of fact, I do. So she went in there. She came out later. That's, like, that's cold-blooded, Joe. You, <laughs> <laughs> test, I'm cool sending theory. her in, You man. sacrificed your friend. What if the ghost Go. is real? <laughs> and it comes out, Joe, you won't believe who was installed next to me. I would have went into the ladies' room if she came oh, back with God. evidence. If, <laughs> So and, apparently, in and, and, and improv training, uh, that's called pimping. Right <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> so another uh, place that's reportedly haunted by uh, Marilyn Monroe is the Knickerbocker. Uh, another claim to fame that the Knickerbocker has is it is the site of a annual seance, from what I've been told, and uh, and boo. Yes. I think you can uh, fill in the rest there. Who yeah. who has an annual seance at the Knickerbocker? Why are you uh, encouraging that nickname, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, one, the one episode. The one episode, episode that's it. Um, so, good old uh, Harry Handcuffs, Harry Houdini, <laughs> uh, I, I, a group of his followers, I guess they, they do seances there and try to find anything they can to try to connect with them because... He was just one of those guys who was extremely popular in the 19 teens and 20s and was doing all, all of these amazing magical feats and escaping from things. Uh, he was one of those people at the time who was a spiritual s skeptic, so he would call out people who were more, yeah. you know. Oh, the irony of this. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's the thing. When I, when I was researching more and more about this, I'm like, oh, wow. What would he think of these people doing this? Almost a hundred years after he died. Well, there's you know? a there's a reason for that, and um, apparently the seances were started by his wife. And the reason is is that Harry said before his passing, if there's some way that I can prove the existence of an afterlife after I'm gone, I will let you know. So his <laughs> wife held that first seance at the Knickerbocker, hoping that Harry would show up. He didn't, but from what I read. It was a big party, and they had a blast, and they continue to do it to this day. Yes. Yep. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase that it was, but it was something sentimental to the wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like a poem or a song or something. Um, where yeah. where yeah. and how did Houdini die? Okay, so I, I, I like this idea because I remember that he met his fate here about 30 miles south of here. He was performing... On the on the riverfront in Detroit, and um, or close to the riverfront, um, at uh, it was called the Garrick Theater, just okay. right at like uh, I think it's it's no longer there, but it's right at Michigan and Griswold, right downtown. And uh, he just he wasn't feeling great, and uh, he apparently had some sort of appendicitis that wasn't diagnosed. Yeah, or, that or like. He's the kind of apparently he was the kind of guy that just wouldn't seek medical uh, attention, like a lot of, you know, macho, guys yeah, yeah. at that time. And he he kept saying, "Hey, the show's got to go on. I got to yeah, perform. The show must go on. I got to yeah. perform in Jeez. Detroit. You know, my audience needs me. Whatever. You know, that true, you know, true performer to the end. Um, but he didn't listen to his body, and uh, ultimately that's what did him in. Now there's 
so there's a story in the corroboration of a lady punching him in the stomach a lot a couple days before. I don't remember how much before his death. And uh, people, a couple people who knew him said, you know, he wasn't himself. He seemed weak. And yeah, if later that... on, it t- turned out he had a, a fever for a couple of days. And the uh, official uh, cause of death is I'll tell you acute what. Uh, appendicitis okay. or idio appendicitis. No, no, that, <laughs> no I, it's not idio. I mean, that's a very. I like, know. I, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, the appendix burst and it probably because, you know, she punched it. <laughs> well, here's here's a story that I read that. Uh, he was known for if he was allowed to prepare, he he had this reputation where he would say he could take a punch to the stomach, and so if someone came up to him and said, "I'm going to punch in the stomach," he'd say, "Give me a second. He would prepare. He would tighten up. They'd hit him with all their might in his stomach, and it wouldn't phase him. And the story that I had read that in Detroit, someone said. Uh, I, I hear you can take a punch of the stomach. He said, that's right. And they went wham and hit him uh, when he wasn't prepared yeah, it was, for it. It was a woman. may yeah. have led to the rupturing right. yes. of his appendix. Now, and that's what yes. I had read. So. And, yeah, it's hard I, to, and it's I, hard to escape when you're having septic shock. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't see any, any, any other foul play, but, but I mean, what the lady did to him. I think her name was Jocelyn something. Mm. She, Gosh. She punched him a couple <laughs> I, I think apparently was... a couple times hard yeah. and, it, and it said below the belt. So oh. I don't know if he How high up did he hike his belt? <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> did she wear the suspenders? Wow. Because, you know, get yeah. his and, get his stuff down there. And anyway. I don't know if we touched on this and, and this would be a good time to maybe bring the podcast to a close, but uh what night did Houdini die? Okay, so it all brings us back to All Hallows Eve, nineteen twenty six. Yes. Man. On Halloween night hey, uh, uh, I lost Harry Houdini. One last thing, that place that was the Garrick Theater, right down at uh Michigan and Griswold, it was turned into some sort of store afterwards and Today it sits completely empty. Wow. That's a great location, and shoot, hmm. I, I might have to go down there, or I, I won't go down there for that. But the next time I'm down there, see if there's any sort of like little grave, or not a grave, a but marker, a marker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If 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 not, why not a city historical marker? That would be great. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I need to email. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Duggan. Yeah. <laughs> now, did he? He didn't die at the theater. Did he die in a hospital? Yeah, it yeah, was. Yeah. But that's where the incident took that's, place at the theater. Yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, it was the, I think it was Grace Hospital. I don't know if okay. that's still existing. So th- maybe uh, maybe someone who's got some medical medical experience so, might but know mean, if Grace Hospital still exists. Uh, there is a Grace Hospital, <laughs> but I don't know if it, uh, the names change so so often these days. Yeah, are they are they putting Houdini's death on Detroit? Is that something that we have to carry? It is. That's that's part of the legend of the history of Detroit. Houdini versus everybody. Where Houdini died. Yep, Jeez. part of our reputation. I, right I, there with honestly, Devil's Night and all that stuff. I would like to uh, investigate that further because, hey, it, I'm sure there's a cool story there that you could dig a little further on. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right, guys, that wraps up our haunted Hollywood episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. I hope you guys have a fun and safe Halloween. Thank you. And spooky. It's my favorite time of the year. I'm really looking forward to it. And I really enjoyed this podcast. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you. And thank you for listening. We will see you next time. Always take the treat, never the trick. (laughs) There you go.